Um, so yes, I would like to start by thanking the Riga Graduate School of Law for inviting me to this very interesting conference. It is indeed an honor to begin in the opportunity to share this floor with so many prominent academics and practitioners. Um, this presentation will focus mostly on the developments of the European Court of Justice case law, which has occurred during the last year, and the direct horizontal effect of EU fundamental rights, or on the charter. Um, I will start off by giving some definitions, just to make it sort of roughly clear on what type of issues I'm talking about. Um, I will then briefly mention the pre-charter case law, so the case law concerning direct horizontal effect of fundamental rights from other sources than the Charter. I will then move on to discuss the case law on the Charter, and I will then end the presentation by bringing up some of the possibilities and problems that this development might lead to. So, just some rough definitions. So, when I speak about EU fundamental rights, I define them basically as constitutionally protected rights. So everything that's, every right that is protected by EU primary law is in my view to be regarded as a fundamental right. So everything in the treaties, the charter, and the general principles. So this includes, for example, the free movement freedoms. Um, direct horizontal effect is a very, I think, contested concept. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what I mean when I talk about it, in the EU context, I think you can define it as situations where a legal norm can be invoked directly between private parties and be given primacy over national legislation. Uh, and this can be done in two ways. Um, you said that you can talk about exclusionary direct horizontal effect where national legislation should be disapplied if it's in a conflict with the EU norm, or the stronger version which you could call a substitutive effect where the EU norm actually sort of replaces the conflicting national norms, so it's applied more directly. Um, it can also be useful to contrast direct horizontal effect with indirect horizontal effect, which is the effect that can be given to directives. Uh, and according to this doctrine, a national court should interpret national legislation in accordance with EU norms, but they can never do a contra legem interpretation, that is, they cannot go against the clearly stating wording of the national legislation. Um, yes, so if we look at the other sources of fundamental rights in the EU, European Union, we can see that when it comes to treaty rights, the right to equal pay between men and women were given direct horizontal effect already in the 1970s in a case which was a conflict between a private company and an employee. Um, direct horizontal effect has also been given to the free movement freedoms. And if you look at most of these cases, uh, the claim has been directed towards organizations that have some kind of regulatory function, which can in some ways be, be compared to a state. So for example, in Bosman, the claim was directed against the national and international football associations, which had place, put in place rules which limited the free movement of football players uh, in the Viking and the Laval. Uh, the claims were directed against unions, which through collective agreements and collective actions uh, was able to sort of restrict free movement when it came to free movement of services and the freedom of establishment. Now it should be mentioned that in the Angonese case, the court said that free movement's good in principle also bind other type of private parties. Uh, but what I can see is that almost all cases concern this kind of organization with some kind of regulatory functions and sometimes speak about a regular functions or regulatory effects doctrine. Um, then we have the general principles, uh, and as you all know, I think the prohibition of age dis discrimination as a general principle has been given direct horizontal effect, um, and the court has done this in a couple of cases where employer, employees have sued private employers, uh, and in these cases there's been sort of a directive cons containing the same right, um, so it has been said that what the court is actually doing is making sure that the directive is effective, even though directives by themselves cannot be given direct horizontal effect. So um, the court starts by investigating what the right contained in the directive entails, and is then sort of 
adds that the same right is also a general principle of EU law and therefore it can be given direct um, horizontal effect in the form of exclusionary effect, meaning that the national court should disapply conflicting national legislation. Um, so to sum up, uh, it would seem that treaty rights can have direct horizontal effect, including substitu substitutionary effect um, in the case of free movement. Uh, this effect will typically materialize when a private body with regulatory function acts in some ways, and the general principle, at least the prohibition on age dis discrimination, can have at least exclusionary effect if there is a directive containing the same right. Uh, so then the question is, what about the charter? Um, and as a background, it should be mentioned that the charter has the same legal status as the treaties, which perhaps could suggest that the charter could be given direct horizontal effect in the same way as the treaty rights can be given it. Uh, on the other hand, we have Article 51 of the charter, which clearly states that it's the EU institutions, organs and bodies, and the member states which are bound by the charter. Uh, and the latter only when they are implementing EU law. So I think you can divide a case law so far into two stages. We have first uh, the early case law, which showed a sort of certain hesitation from the Court of Justice. I uh, suggest so to bring a few examples in the Dominguez case, which concerned the right to paid vacation laid down in a directive, which had been wrongfully implemented into French law. Uh, the Advocate General had a very long, detailed discussion on whether Article 31, Paragraph 2 of the Charter, where the same right is laid down, could be given direct horizontal effect. Um, the Court of Justice, on the other hand, completely ignored that question uh, and instead told Dominguez to ask for compensation from the French state uh, in accordance with the Frankovich Doctrine because France had not implemented the directive correctly. Um, a while later came the AMS case, which concerned writers, uh, sorry, workers' right to information and consultation within a company. Uh, this right is protected by directive, but also by Article 27 of the Charter. Uh, and in this case, the court found that France, once again, had not implemented the directive correctly. Uh, but it also stated that Article 27 of the Charter was too imprecise to be given direct horizontal effect. And what was quite interesting with this case is that the court then added that uh, Article 21 on the Charter on discrimination, and more specifically, I think they mentioned only age discrimination, um, could have direct horizontal effect. Uh, and of course, this article had nothing to do at all with the case, so it was just, I guess, the court opening up for, for giving the short direct horizontal effect and waiting to see what reactions they would get. Not too long after came the Dansk industry case, I guess I'll sometimes referred to the IOS case, uh, which concerned age discrimination. So one could have perhaps expected that a court, following its statement in AMS, uh, should give the charter direct horizontal effect. Um, however, it did not. Uh, it did discuss the charter in some parts of the judgment, but when it actually came to the question of direct horizontal effect, it only brought up the um, prohibition on age discrimination as a general principle of EU law. So it didn't, at least in any clear way, um, say that the charter could have direct horizontal effect. Uh, and this case is, of course, very interesting because, as several speakers already said, the Danish Supreme Court refused to comply with the judgment, arguing, among other things, that it was being contrast to in conflict with legal certainty for the private parties. So I think this early case law shows that uh, this question of direct horizontal effect uh, has been controversial both within the court and also from the perspective of at least some EU member states. So if we then move on to the more present case law, which started about a year ago, we have firstly the Egenberg case, where a job applicant was discriminated on uh, due to her not having the same religion as an organization she was applying for a job to. Um, and this was in accordance with German law, so it had this exception for religious organizations, 
um, that they could demand that the, their employees should have the same religion as the organization. But it was found to be in violation of the directive and also Article 21 of the Charter. Uh, and in this case, the court asked the national court to firstly to try to interpret the national legislation in conformity with the directive, but if that wasn't possible, it should disapply the national legislation. So it gave the charter direct horizontal effect in the form of exclusionary effect. Um, and so to support its finding, it referred back to the AMS case. Uh, said basically, it's, yeah, we're just following our case law in AMS. Um, and it also added that Article 21 of the Charter is, is sort of is in the same way as the treaty articles, mandatory and sufficient in itself to confer rights to individuals in horizontal situation. So it sort of referred back to the case law such as Defren, Angonese, and Viking. Uh, then came the IR case, which was quite similar, so I won't talk anything more about that one. Um, then in November last year, I think it was, came the Bauer and Wilmot case, which concerned the right to paid vacation, which is laid down in a directive, but also in Article 31, Paragraph 2 of the Charter. So the same right which was discussed in the Dominguez case. Uh, and here the court found that the Charter article was sufficient in itself to confer that right, and it added two arguments for this conclusion. First, it stated that the fact that Article 51 one does not mention private parties does not mean that these are not bound by the Charter. And secondly, that the right to paid vacation, sort of by its nature, <coughs> entails a corresponding duty on the behalf of all employers to grant that vacation. Um, then we have the Max Planck case, which was quite similar, and the Hein case, also quite similar. Um, what was interesting about that case was that the court stressed that national courts uh, cannot do anything to protect the legitimate expectations of the private parties. So they cannot sort of uh, limit the temporal scope of the judgment in any way. So they have to sort of enforce the charter right away, even though the National Supreme Courts had previously said that this were, law was in compliance with EU law. Um, then the last case to mention, um, in my mind, perhaps the most interesting case is the Cresco Investigations case, which came from Austria. Um, and in this case, the court found that an Austrian law that gave certain religious minorities an extra day of vacation in order to celebrate a religious holiday was directly discriminatory. So it they said it was against a directive, but also against Article 21 of the Charter. Um, and what I think was quite interesting is what comes next. So the court then states what, sort of gives some instructions to the national court, what they should do then. Um, and they did not tell the national court to disapply this law, which gave this religious minority an extra day of vacation. Instead, they told them to, or told Austria that until Austria changed its law, all workers in the country should be given this day off. Uh, so the Court of Justice basically instituted a new national holiday in Austria, which has, uh, was quite extraordinary. Uh, and of course, it was the private employers, to a larger extent, who have to pick up the bill for this sort of legislative mistake, which perhaps can be questioned. Um, so to sum up this case law, uh, we can see that all of these cases so far concern the relationship between employers and employees or job seekers. Uh, moreover, in all cases, there is a directive where the fundamental right is specified, which, had been, which has been incorrectly implemented by the member state. Uh, and the court's methodology in these cases seems to be that it, it first starts off by describing what the right in the directive entails, then asks the national court to do all it can to interpret the national legislation in accordance with the directive. And then, if that's not possible, it states that the same right can be found in the charter and that the charter right have direct horizontal effect. And I think in all cases, except for Cresco investigation, the court tells the national court to disapply the national legislation. While in Cresco, I think it goes a step further and actually sort of substitutes the national law with the charter. Um, 
Yes, so some preliminary reflections on this case law. Uh, and I would be very happy to get your thoughts on these. Um, if we start with the possibilities, uh, of course it makes it a little bit easier to, do, to directly claim fundamental rights protection because you can claim your rights against more parties, which of course can be seen as positive. Um, it also increases the possibility to put the blame on the deserving party. So for example, if say Google has violated your privacy, I mean, I guess it would feel better to actually be able to make that claim against Google directly and instead of trying to go after the member state for not complying with a directive or something. Um, it also lessens the sometimes somewhat arbitrary distinction between public and private parties. Uh, and you can see this in several situations. I mean, firstly, when it comes to employment law, I mean, it should really matter if I'm employed at a public or a private university. I mean, the basic sort of employment contracts are the same, so why should I not be given the same right regardless of my employer's private or public? Um, there's also this development that's been going on in, I guess, most member states for a long time now where the what used to be sort of core state function has been privatized, schools, healthcare, and so on. So now it's not always easy to to establish where, whether these privatized uh, companies uh, can be seen as sort of acting out from the acting out of state obligations or not. So it sort of make it easier if you don't have to always think very hardly if it's a state that acts or a private party. And then lastly, um, this new case law seems to give the charter a similar applicability as the treaty as the treaties and the general principles of EU law. Uh, which, of course, makes some sense, since they have the same legal status. Um, yes. So, what about the problems? Um, firstly, I think it's still worth mentioning that I think it is quite hard to reconcile the this case law with Article 51.1 of the Charter, because the, this article explicitly, explicitly states that it's the EU and the member states that are bound by the Charter. And since the Charter is a relatively new document, one could have a, perhaps expected that if the intention was that it should also bind private parties, that, this, that they should have been inserted. Um, now, the European Court of Justice sort of responds to this question in Bauer, uh, by stating that the fact that Article 51 does not mention private parties does not necessarily mean that these are not bound by the Charter. And I guess this is true, but I would then again claim that the non-mentioning of private parties at least establishes a sort of a presumption that they are not bound by it. So if the court wants to extend the Charter to uh, apply between private parties, they should at least sort of... Um, give proper justification, and I don't think they really have done that so far. Because, I mean, the, the fact that maybe it's not impermissible to use the charter against the, uh, individuals may not be, in, it's not in itself or e a reason to do so. I think you need something more. Um, the next problem is the lack of foreseeability and legal certainty for private parties. And I think it's quite hard to say the least for a private party to know in which situations it is bound by the Charter. So I think they would have to make five, at least five determinations to, to uh, be able to evaluate whether they are bound or not. Firstly, they would need to examine whether national legislation is based on a directive. Secondly, to evaluate whether national legislation correctly implements the directive. Thirdly, to determine whether the directive contains rules which are clear enough to give rise to give rise to rights, and fourthly, to examine whether there is a corresponding charter right, and fifthly, to determine whether the charter right can have direct horizontal effect, because not all charter rights can be given direct horizontal effect. Um, and I mean, a, a mistake in any of these steps will lead to a private party uh, being found guilty of a fundamental rights violation, which I think is quite a, a serious thing. Um, and the private party will be responsible 
for this violation, even though it has only acted in accordance with national law and probably also in accordance with the national constitutional laws and the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and the third point is that the blame is not always put on the serving party, uh, actually. I think the Cresco investigation case shows this, that, I mean, the private employers had not done anything wrong. It was the Austrian state which has first forced them to sort of positively discriminate a minority uh, and then came the Court of Justice and said, okay, now you have to extend this to the whole population. It was not a choice by the private employers in any way. Um, a fourth point is that I think, at least as I see it, the basic idea of fundamental rights is to protect citizens from abuse from the state. And in this way, I think you can say that fundamental rights has this kind of emancipatory quality. And I think this quality is to some extent lost uh, when the rights not only are, in, when you cannot only use the rights, but the rights can also be used against you. So, I mean, that's not to say that there are not any reasons to not to give their actors on effect, but it certainly makes the fundamental rights more of a double-edged sword, I would say. Um, I think there's also an issue um, with how the, the way that, form, that fundamental rights are formulated, and especially if you look at the uh, rights limitation clause in Article 52.1, um, it states quite clearly that in order to limit a, a fundamental right, you need support by legislation. But private parties do not have any legislative competence, so they can never sort of do a permissible limitation of a right. And that is because they were never intended to be bound by rights, as I said. So all they can do is say that they followed national legislation, but that is not a, uh, an argument that the court will accept. A fifth potential problem, um, which I think is quite closely connected to the topic of this conference, is that by giving the Charter direct horizontal effect, the Court of Justice goes further than the European Court of Human Rights has done, and I think many constitutional courts has done. I think it's in most legal system, it's quite a controversial question to give national fundamental rights direct horizontal effect. Uh, but I think there's a risk that when the Court of Justice says that EU fundamental rights have direct horizontal effect, this might sort of push national courts to do the same with their national fundamental rights in order not for them to sort of lose influence like, towards the Court of Justice. And there's a risk sort of that the Charter will take over as the main uh, source of fundamental rights in Europe. And then we have the last point, and then I'll finish. Um, we have the issue of the interaction between directives and the charter. Because as, as I said, in all of the cases where the charter has been given, the directives on effect, there's been a directive uh, with a corresponding right which has not been implemented correctly. And basically, most of the court's argumentation is focused on the directive, so it always sort of tests the national legislation against the directive. And then when it has concluded that the implementation is incorrect, then it sort of adds that, oh, you know, we have the same right in the charter. Uh, and then it enforces that directly against the private party. But I think there's a risk here that this means that the, uh, the level of protection of the charter is set by the directive. And I don't think it's necessarily so that these directives have sort of the same level of protection as the Charter necessarily would have. Um, and I think this is, well, it's problematic for the private party who's been found guilty of a fundamental rights violation, although it's at least possible that actually the Charter did not really demand this. Uh, and secondly, I think it might be problematic because it also binds the EU legislator, because the EU legislator cannot really change the directive and give a lesser level of protection because now the court has said that the level of protection in the directive is the same as the, what the ones that the charter has. So 
I don't know if this will be a problem, but I think it could be. Uh, and also, there is no Article 52.1 uh, evaluation of the national legislation. The national legislation is only evaluated uh, from the perspective of the directive, which can be a sort of different determination. Um, so, to conclude, I mean, with, as with most things in life, there are, you know, positive and negative consequences. Um, I guess the question that I'm left with is, is it really necessary to give the shorter direct horizontal effect? I'm not sure. But I think I'll stop here and take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Are there any questions? No. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I do actually find um, uh, one broader view, uh, human rights and uh, and uh, private relations, a really interesting topic. I don't think that current, as you mentioned, it's not a topical problem currently because it, it's not really that big of a, let's see, let's say court activism in that field. There are obviously legislative uh, aspects, for example, in com consumer law where the court does uh, expand the encroach on, let's say, private autonomy and the principles of private uh, private law. But, um, and I also find it really interesting that you mentioned that, yes, well, this is uh, this, it's currently just the problem with, uh, with the EU law and the way that the uh, court kind of finds um, some, implements the directives horizontally, which, was not, which were not supposed to be that way, through the, by like, grabbing the larger right. For example, either the freedom of movement or freedom of, of uh, of uh, workers or dis the discrimination, but um, and I also think that it is pro it, it, and the the problem would be if the court actual courts constitutional courts would recognize the, that it, yes we, this is something we we ought to do, and I also find it interesting that this that this this could be um, applied the way we see for example tort uh, tort law because there are definitely are theories which kind of incorporate the let's say material fairness in the court uh, in the intellect or in tort. Which is definitely kind of alien to the to the well private law as such, and they always do it through human rights. So therefore, this is uh, something maybe it's not as top topical, but as the law progresses, it could be. So yeah, I mean, you, can you give it a comment on but on the let's say the how you see it when 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 with this will can become a problem? And uh, I'll go outside, for example, employment law and all these specific uh, private law uh, uh, well, fields. Oof, oof. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think one problem will be, I think it will become even more of a problem when, if the directives are not as clear uh, as they've been so, so far. Um, so if the court just uses a directive to bring situation within EU law and then starts to sort of argument from the rights of the charter more freely and impose them on private parties, and I think that would be make things considerably worse from a sort of legitimate expectations and legal certainty standpoint. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure if I can answer your question very well. <laughs> no, no, there's also, I mean, I was thinking of um, maybe there's, uh, there's a way uh, that through the human rights they could recognize uh, for example, a breach of a, a private law. In, uh, let's, let's, for example, there's a delic case, and there's a not uh, the country has not, for example, recognized as, as, a, as a, um, the uh, for example, reputation as as our uh, as it is recognized in human rights, uh, or the um, level is not as is not applied. Uh, the level of uh, well, let's say was of uh, appreciation is not as high as it is in human rights. And through that, uh, through this uh, way of, impl uh, of horizontal implementation of human rights, now the, uh, the court start to recognize this has had to increase the level of uh, appreciation in the in private, in uh, in private law. And this is maybe a you know, and, and they're also recognizing other, for example, objects of uh, of 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 of, uh, of, what, of of or of interest, which could be could could which are listed in human rights, but are not listed in in. Uh, 
private law as such. So, yeah.